kind of realize now that I had been indoctrinated myself into thinking that this could be real. I was a product of the society we live in now where everyone thinks that this is completely normal, that people can be any gender they want. And in that very moment, I thought potentially she could be transgender. You can choose to be a boy, a girl, neither, or both. The pronoun question is a direct attack on the nature of creation and the nature of God. We set them up and say, if you don't go down this path, you're going to commit suicide. That's affirming a person in their suicidal ideation. But somehow in this context, it's OK. They're in middle school. It's, it's, a, it's a hellish environment for them. They're trying to figure out they want to be liked. They want to be accepted. And they go to the school counselor who says, uh, I have a place where you, I know you're going to be accepted, and it's the Gay and Lesbian Student Alliance. If we don't deal with this, we're going to lose our country, we're going to lose our freedoms, we're going to lose our families, uh, we're going to lose everything. My number one advice to parents is get your kids out of public schools. They're not safe. Well, we're a pretty normal family, I would say. We met in college. She was sort of the girl next door. Um, moved in next, me and my roommate, and, and, and that's sort of where our journey began. Got married shortly after when you joined the Army. We did four years in Virginia for your tour. We actually started our family while in the Army, so we had our daughter when we were just 22 years old. Um, alone in the army, figured it out, figured out how to parent together, grew up together. And so we, we have a really close relationship, especially with our daughter, because she kind of grew up with us. We were, we were young parents and we all figured it out together. Moved back to Florida, lived there for about eight years. Um, and that's when we started to notice that Florida was not necessarily where we wanted to raise a family. That we wanted seasons and more kids to play with. We had visited Colorado a bunch of times um, coming here on trips and thought wouldn't that be cool if we could actually live there full time and and we made the leap sold everything sold our house and and moved out here just to try to you know, make a better life for ourselves in Colorado and give our kids a better outdoor experience yeah overall um, you found a job here it was a really quick move it was kind of spur of the moment spontaneous, <laughs> which we tend to be. Just so incredibly tragic. Um, it, it really breaks your heart. And, and, and I, you know, I don't think that a lot of the teachers who are doing this are necessarily meaning to do evil. You know, they're, they're being taught that this is the correct way and that this is what you have to do, that this is what the modern era is, that this is what the studies show, um, and so you have to do this. But what it's doing is it's, it's turning our, our country into a, a wasteland of broken homes and broken families. And what happens when a family breaks up, this is something with multi-generational consequences. Right? When, when a family is destroyed, that's going to affect your children, and that's going to affect their children, and that's going to affect their children, and that's going to have an impact on the community, and that's going to have an impact on the church. And this is something that it's just like a nuclear bomb going off and ripping through everything. Um, and, and so much of it is directly the result of what's being taught to children in the public schools. That one of the main LGBTQ activist organizations here in Florida had partnered. They had infiltrated 63 out of 67 counties under the guise of safety and anti-bullying. I can't think of anything more important than alerting parents and alerting pastors to what's happening and helping them to protect future generations. Because if we don't deal with this, we're going to lose our country, we're going to lose our freedoms, we're going to lose our families, uh, we're going to lose everything. So 2020, 
year of COVID, we um, planned to have a third child and we realized we didn't have enough space in the house we were in um, here in Northern Colorado. So we built a new house in a suburb and um, a very conservative suburb that we felt matched our family values. That would be a good place to raise our family. There's only 10,000 people here. I grew up in a small town of, of about 20,000 people and it just felt right. So we, we built this house that would accommodate our growing family and um, moved into the suburb. And with that came new schools, new church, new community entirely. And you know, for a, what were they, 10 and five year old at the time, that's quite an adjustment. So our, our kids definitely, um, that coupled with COVID, put us into a place where they were kind of isolated, like most kids during the COVID lockdowns. And here in Northern Colorado, the lockdowns were strict. We, when we enrolled them in school, we couldn't see their classroom. The kids were masked. They were remote for the first part of their, their first school year here. They were, um, you know, distance learning. And when they were in person, they had to be six feet from each other. And that definitely had an effect on, on our daughter's well-being, especially being, you know, new to middle school and, and going through that hard time that all adolescent girls do. Um, the COVID lockdown definitely contributed to it, but being in a new place was tough for her. We knew as a family it would be a big change for us to move the kids to a new town, a new house, all new friends. Um, little did we know that COVID was about to hit before mm -hmm. we closed on the house. So it was much more difficult on the family than we had originally intended it to be um, and much more difficult on not only our daughter but on our son as well. Luckily for us, he's a little bit better at making friends so he ran around the neighborhood and basically met everyone and was everyone's best friend immediately um, but our daughter definitely internalized it and it was a lot a lot more difficult for her to transition to the new neighborhood yeah we closed on this house the week shutdowns happened and so it was all we, we didn't know what to expect everyone i think thought it was a temporary shutdown that turned into for our school district a year and a half of remote learning and distance and masking and I don't think we really fully understood what was coming. Nor did we understand how vulnerable it would make our daughter. Yeah. I think that's, that's really important here is, is before we moved, she was a lot, a lot more confident, mm -hmm. a lot outgoing. more outgoing. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely the, the move and coupled with COVID sort of set her on that, that sort of mm -hmm. path to be a little bit more susceptible to, to what she experienced. That and add to that adding a new a new sibling into the mix. So July of 2020, our third child was born, and so she's in a new town, doesn't have her friends, can't go to school, and now our attention is turned away from our older kids. Really, a new a new baby, it's inevitable. They're they're demanding, and so that that definitely contributed to her her withdrawal socially. I would say. Public schools for a long time were seen as what was called in Latin in local parents, in place of the parents. So they were not the parents, they were reinforcing what the parents taught. And the purpose of public schools was to provide a literate people who were capable of thinking. So we had factual things that we taught. We taught math, we taught science, we, we taught things that were everybody needs to know in a culture. Regardless of what was happening with that child, all parents were deemed a potential danger to their child and were being systematically cut out of these social transitions, which is really a psychosocial medical intervention that schools are grossly unqualified to do, but especially without parental involvement. They're in middle school, it's, it's, a, it's a hellish environment for them. They're trying to figure out, they want to be liked, they want to be accepted, and they go to the school counselor who says, oh, uh, I have a place where you, I know you're going to be accepted, and it's the Gay and Lesbian Student Alliance. And it's a wonderful group of kids that they themselves have been marginalized because of the cruelty of the other students. Come join and let's have a meeting. Well, on, on my speaking tour in 2019, I, I could not count anymore the number of parents who came up to me after my talk crying, just bawling. Uh, saying, you know, I wish I knew this before I sent my kids to a public school. And it almost makes me cry. I mean, th these are decent, God-fearing, good people who thought they were doing what they were supposed to do to send their kids to public school. 
and then they lost their kids. Their, their kids were indoctrinated to the point where they wouldn't even talk to their parents anymore. They, they, the kids were told that their parents were fascist or white supremacists or you know, whatever it was. Um, and, and so it, it's just absolute devastation. Uh, and, and this is happening not just in isolated cases, this is happening at the level of millions and millions of people. There are so many broken hearts across this country as a direct result of the propaganda and the indoctrination of children. No, I think a lot of this stuff, it, it's just kind of tough. Um, yeah, picked her up from school that day, um, kind of a normal day. She had stayed after school for this club. You know, I was excited to see how, how the club went mm -hmm. during that car trip home. She basically was like, oh, it was a great art club, dad. You know, we did fun stuff and it was, it was, it was excellent. She didn't open up to me right away. I was basically unaware that it was not art club at that time, that it was gender and sexuality awareness club. I think it wasn't until she came into my office to eventually tell me that now she was identifying as transgender until I realized what had happened. I think she came into my office with a flag she was given during this class and, and looked at me with a smile and said, Dad, I'm transgender. And, and then basically scurried off. I think that was, that was my, first, my first experience with it, mm -hmm. at least her trying to come out and tell me, which um, I think was, was odd. I don't think I, I really fully understood what was just said. I think she was kind of just joking around, like, here's a flag, Dad, haha, I'm being silly. And she sort of ran out of my office. Um, come to find out it was, it was not a joke. Um, somebody had really told her that since she's uncomfortable, she's transgender, and she, she really took that to heart. Um, come to find out um, later on in the day when, when discussing it with my wife a little bit deeper, we did find out that she wasn't, she wasn't in art club. Um, it was never meant to be an art club. She was just told to lie to her parents to tell them whatever it was to make it make sense for them. Yeah. Um, which she did. She told us it was art club, which made perfect sense to us. So obviously we didn't, we didn't think twice about it. Um, well, it was the art teacher in the art room. We were completely unsuspecting. And that was my experience as well, that she, I, I'll never forget. I was in my bedroom talking to my mom on the phone and she came in and handed me the flag and I didn't know what it was. So I had to Google it. <laughs> and learned it was a transgender flag. And she kind of did the same thing, handed it to me in, in a kind of silly manner, smiling, and then ran off. And so I realized what it was and I went into her room and I said, what does this mean? Does this represent you? And she said, yes. And this was you know, hours after the art club incident. And I, I kind of realized now that I had been indoctrinated myself into thinking that this could be real. I was a product of the society we live in now where everyone thinks that this is completely normal, that people can be any gender they want. And in that very moment, I thought potentially she could be transgender. And so I have to be really careful about how I approach it. And so I was really, you know, I kind of took the, the friend approach, like, okay, tell me more. Tell yeah. me why you feel this way. It was, it was shocking to see that in three hours time that sort of message could be so ingrained in her head. It, it, was, it was amazing to me. And that's sort of, I think, why I brushed it off, because there was no inclination prior to this of her showing any sort of gender dysphoria mm -hmm. or transgenderism or wanting to be an opposite sex or wanting to be, or really even being uncomfortable to that degree. I found it really very difficult to sort of wrap my head around how powerful the whatever message they gave her that day was for for it to sink in and really cha change her life that much um, and change ours yeah i went through a whole range of emotions i started with oh maybe this is real i better be careful not to say anything i can't take back or isolate her because we do have a very open relationship we we always have she's always felt comfortable talking to us that's why she came home and told us what happened it's why she was almost excited to proclaim you know this transgender status. It was clear to me that in that meeting, 
they got her excited about it. They praised her for proclaiming that she's transgender. Well, you're not comfortable in your body. That means you're trans. And here's the toys that correspond with your new label. And they got her excited. And they, they made her think it was this great, wonderful, joyful thing. And I think that was really reflected in how she approached us with it. That it was, you know, she was smiling and it was silly. And um, I don't know if she knew how we were going to react, but I went through a range of emotions. I started with wondering if it was real and then realizing this isn't real. I know my daughter. It took me a minute. It was just so much shock. Yeah. There, nothing could have ever prepared us for that moment. It was just a regular Tuesday. And she came home and she was a whole different person. And our lives have not been the same since. Um, and by the end of the evening, you know, at the end of the range of emotions, it's almost like all the stages of grief. I was shocked and then I was angry and then I was really, really sad, really sad because it's clear she took this to heart and she was going to live out this label and I, we were not equipped to handle it. And there's this mindset that you know, all you can do is affirm a child in that moment, that you have to go with what they say and, and go along with it. And it, we knew we couldn't do that. And so we didn't know how, how to move forward and not affirm what she was feeling because we knew it wasn't real. I don't think they explained to her what it truly meant to be transgender or be part of that community, um, what that came along with, what medical procedures they're pushing very quickly on these children. Now that we've spoken more openly with her about it and she understands sort of what happened to her in that moment, she's shocked that she came so close to some of these things that they would have done to her. The puberty blockers, the surgeries, really, she, she had no idea mm -hmm. that, that, that that's part of that label that they gave her, which was, which is, you know, obviously they, it's all, Sunshine, rainbows, glitter. Love bombing is what I call it. it. It's unbelievable. So the kids are, are attracted to all of those things. Well, how can it be bad? Rainbows and unicorns, this must be amazing. Really, there's a dark, dark side to it all. And they did talk about puberty blockers in art club. They did, the, the outside presenter that was invited in to this meeting to talk to our child talked about puberty blockers and about stopping the discomfort that you're feeling in your body. Sure. Right, and every 12-year-old girl goes through that discomfort. It's called puberty, it's normal. You have to learn to deal with it. Every little girl has to go through that discomfort and learn how to come out on the other side. And what they did with her is say, you don't have to go through that. Here's a Band-Aid. Just put on the Band-Aid and all your discomfort will go away. And she was excited by that. She was uncomfortable. And someone said, I can make this all go away for you. And there's rainbows and it's exciting and we're gonna celebrate you for proclaiming that you're transgender. And it. I think she was just excited about it, and she didn't understand the the dark medicalization behind you know the trajectory they would have put her on. These are dangerous. It causes bone loss. It causes cancer. It you know causes sterility. These are life altering decisions that they are putting on twelve year olds' shoulders, and children that age aren't capable of making those kinds of decisions. In fact, when, when our daughter came home that night and we, you know, we went through this range of emotions and, and we didn't really let, lead on to it with her, I think I locked myself in the bathroom and cried for hours. I think we were both in the bathroom crying and she didn't know we were upset by it and we didn't want her to know we were upset. We didn't want to attach any shame or any more discomfort to what she was going through. So we kind of dealt with it privately. Um, yeah. My name is January Littlejohn. I live in Tallahassee, Florida, and I have three children. And at the height of COVID, our daughter at age 13 came to us and told us she did not feel like a girl, that she was experiencing confusion over her sex. This was shortly after three other friends in her in-person friend group also suddenly claimed transgender identities. And this was at the height of COVID, and a lot of children and adolescents were struggling Emotionally, mentally, it was a scary time. So we sought the help of a mental health professional to help us navigate this issue with our daughter. We took it very seriously. I'm also a licensed mental health counselor. And so I have been trained in 
At the time, it was gender identity disorder, which is now called gender dysphoria. But my daughter at the time did not meet criteria for gender dysphoria. So it was very confusing for us as her parents to watch a child suddenly, out of the blue, experience this level of confusion. And it escalated very rapidly. Her mental health started to spiral. Again, we thought it may be due to the isolation and school closings. And when school started in the fall, we were able to put them back into school. They called it brick and mortar as opposed to online. But parents were not allowed on campus. And we knew our daughter wanted to go by a different name and pronouns, but we felt like this was escalating very quickly. And we told her we would not call her a new name and pronouns at home, that we were going to navigate this with a professional and take it from there. I told a teacher via email that our daughter was struggling, that she had never had any issues prior, and that we felt like it was directly related to her friend group. It turned out this teacher was the LGBTQ advocate on campus. Several weeks into the school, my, my, my daughter got into the car and said, Mom, I had a meeting at school today about my name because we knew she wanted to go by a different name. But honestly, we thought, A, we couldn't stop her, and B, we thought it would be treated like a nickname. And she said to me, they asked me which restroom I wanted to use. I was shocked. They can't give her medication. They can't even show her a PG-13 movie without my permission and signature. So I was very confused as to, number one, how they could have a meeting without notifying me, but number two, why were they asking her which restroom she wanted to use? And I was told by both the guidance counselor and the assistant principal, Mrs. Littlejohn, we cannot give you any information about the meeting we had with your daughter. Actually, they didn't say daughter, they said child. Your child is now protected by a non-discrimination law. We continued to ask her for legal justification. What legal justification do you have that you are using to meet with our 13-year-old daughter without our knowledge or consent? And we were, we were not given any until we were finally given a meeting with the principal. And we were shown the transgender, gender non-conforming support plan that they completed with our 13-year-old daughter behind closed doors with three adults. It was the assistant principal, the guidance counselor, and a social worker we had never met. And this was a six page document where they did not just ask her about names and pronouns. They asked her which restroom and locker room she preferred to use, which sex she preferred to room with on overnight field trips. They asked her, how should we refer to you when speaking to your parents? Should we call you your birth name and pronouns or should we use your preferred name? And this is to effectively deceive parents that these social transitions have ever taken place. And the only question they asked our 13 year old child that would determine whether or not we would be notified and invited to this meeting was, are your parents supportive? That was it. So they put the sole decision on our child as to whether or not our parental rights and authority would be honored. And this created a huge wedge between us and our child. By only affirming these children in any identity that they choose, it's really sending the message to these children that their parents' authority is no longer needed or wanted. Yeah, this has now become ubiquitous. It's happening all over the country. And, and there's this mythology among 
uh, a lot of parents, and I think they just tell themselves this to comfort themselves, but that's not happening here. You know, we, we live in a remote Nebraska community, and you know, that might happen in California or Illinois, but it's not happening here. The reality is it is happening everywhere. I had downloaded from, I think it was the Orange County Department of Education's website, this so-called gender transition form. Um, and they had like, these individual transition plans where they were helping kids go through this transition. And they actually volunteer that they're gonna help uh, the, the children hide this from their parents. And so in California, you know, I knew California was kind of at the cutting edge of this madness. And so I wasn't terribly surprised, but I was giving a lecture uh, on education in a very conservative community here in Florida. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the entire county commission is Republican. I mean, every elected office in this area is held by Republicans. It's a rural, extremely conservative place. And I had a school board member come up to me afterwards, and she had heard me talking about these uh, this gender transition form out of California. And she says, Alex, that exact same form is being used in this county. And that's when I knew, oh man, this is everywhere. And, and I started looking and yeah, this exact same form or slight variations of it was being used even in conservative states, even in conservative districts in conservative states. So we immediately pulled her out of the school. We, um, I actually, that evening, she handed me the business card of a woman who had been invited into her art club that day that was not art club. And that evening I emailed this woman kind of desperately like, tell me what you did. What what happened in this classroom? I need to know what you told my daughter. She came home completely confused and uncomfortable. And I don't recognize what she's doing right now. I don't recognize her. And um, the woman responded the next day and it was just, you know, doubling down on everything that she had done with these kids. Like she was proud of it. She talked about, you know, using these flags to describe defining terms. And she even said she told the kids parents might not be safe. And that it's okay to be dishonest with your parents about where you are. She was open about that. So it that set off so many alarms in both of our heads. Like, oh, wow. Okay, this is not an isolated incident. There's an agenda here. This woman knew what she was doing with our daughter. And she's clearly good at it. Yep. Because I've always thought of our daughter to be very independent thinker. And very mature for her age, you know, when it comes to understanding emotions. And she's not someone I ever thought could be captured in a three-hour meeting by someone she's never met. And, and she definitely was. So it, it was clear to me that this woman was, um, this was not her first time indoctrinating kids into transgender ideology. Her response was shocking because she was so proud of what she had done. Yes, this is what I do. Here's how I do it. Wonderful, rainbows, sunshine, amazing, with undertones of parents aren't safe. Yes, we, we tell them to lie to kids because, well, that's what we do. And we're proud of it. We're going to continue to do it. Uh, first and foremost, teaching a child in a school setting to lie to your parents is unbelievable to me. Yeah. Um, should be unbelievable to everybody. Obviously, we found that it's not. Um, and the very first thing that you get told is, oh, well, you're, you're a bigot. You're, you're a bad parent because you don't want your, somebody to teach your child to lie to you, which is just unbelievable. And we have experienced so many people now that, that feel the same way. Oh, well, you're just a bad parent. You know, the children need to lie to you, which... Yeah, that's an argument we get a lot. Which that, is, well, of course they lied to you. Look at you. You're unsupportive. Yeah, because you're speaking up, you're unsupportive. And the reality is that our daughter talked to us both about it that day because we are supportive. Because we have worked very hard to have an open, honest relationship and good communication with our kids. And thank God, because I have met other families with children in that classroom who didn't go home and tell their parents. They followed the rules that what you hear and hear, keep in here, and your parents aren't safe. There were other little girls who lived with this secret for a year until our story went public and their parents realized that there were dots that needed to be connected and they started asking the right questions of their children. So we're really lucky that we caught it when we did, that she felt comfortable telling us because we know of, of other families in the community who suffered, little girls suffered in silence and parents were left in the dark completely. And they thought they were alone, which they weren't. Mm -hmm. um, this is happening to parents everywhere, all over the country. And, and in particular in our, our area is sort of a seemingly a hotbed for it. Um, and, and, it and it not only was this area, but it was also sort of the same teacher, same school, same, same 
same everything, same actors involved, mm -hmm. which I think was, which was very interesting to us originally, thinking maybe it was an isolated issue. Come to find out, it's definitely not an isolated issue. It comes from, from the top. Yeah. We're not alone at all. No. We've just learned that it's a sensitive issue and it pertains to our young children and parents aren't willing to talk about it publicly. And I, I understand that. I've received a lot of hate for being honest about what happened to us. And, and so I, I think there's a, you know, a gaslighting effort. I think that there's a lot of intimidation that happens. There's a lot of false information thrown at parents and, and they've successfully been kept silent. So the day after the incident, you called the principal. Yep, of Angry. course. Yep. I mean, the fact that this happened in a school setting without me knowing was was unbelievable to me. So obviously, the first thing I did was call the principal. It was not a very good conversation to start. I was very angry, um, obviously very upset with with what the school had done or allowed to be done in their in their campus. So spoke with him. He originally had had expressed concern for what had happened, expressed to us that it was a third party presenter and it was in an after school club. Um, and, and they have very little control over some of the things that are said and done in those settings, which was alarming to me, obviously. And he said that he, what he later on called us and said, hey, I, I want to come and meet you at your home, um, which we thought was interesting, having a principal come to our home. But we, we brushed it off as, hey, we're in a small town now. There's 10,000 people. The principal will come to your home to speak to you. Well, that, we thought that was great. Maybe we can have a face-to-face figure out, you know, how, you know, what, what is even our path forward here? How do we, how do we go about not only handling our own situation, but making sure that it, this isn't happening to other kids at this school. Um, so he eventually came here to our home. We sat out on our, our patio um, and had a really a heart to heart conversation. We explained what happened. He, he, he expressed to us that he was, you know, he was sorry in what had happened. He, he, he really felt genuine in what he was trying to convey to us, that he didn't mean for this to happen. These are you know, confidential sessions. These are all, these are clubs that are after school and they have very little control over it. We really thought from that conversation that things were going to change or that he would give us the tools we needed to fix the situation not only in the school but help us with our with our with our daughter and what yeah. was going on and and really get down to the bottom of you know who is this woman why is this club here and, and what is she trying to do to our kids we probably talked on the porch for three hours um he very poignant emotional. conversation we were emotional he was emotional um father to father he said John, I don't think I could handle the same situation that you're going through. If my daughter came up to me when I walked in the door and said, Dad, I'm, I'm transgender or I'm not a girl anymore, I couldn't have done that, which really gave me sort of the, the false sense of, almost sense of security. I thought, okay, well, this, this principal is being sincere. He's the principal. He obviously has the authority and the power to, to do something at that establishment. Um, but it turns out that that visit with us was actually what we believe to be in lieu of a well child check from CPS, yep. which once my wife had done a FOIA requests for emails, that is what the very first thing the school did was they colluded with this woman, um, with this organization and with all the other counselors um, in PSD. And, and this third party um, organization was actually the first one to say, we should send CPS to their home to do a well child check. So that is what I think drove him to come to our house mm -hmm. was to sort of come here and say, Hey, are these good parents? What's their family life like? Yeah. I think he very quickly noticed, Hey, this is a normal middle-class family living here in Northern Colorado. There's nothing to worry about. I hope so. We CPS didn't show up knocking at our door after that visit. But again, I did find in public record emails that they colluded with the school board and with this external party to conduct a well child check. And it's because we never let our daughter return to school the next day. We, you know, I said we cried all night and we woke up the next day and said, there's no way she's stepping foot in that school again. I don't trust anyone. They hurt her. They hurt us. They attacked our family. I'm not putting my children back 
in their setting and allowing anything like this to happen again. And so that prompted them to question our parenting and to send someone in for a well child check on the welfare of our children. We truly were under attack. We were in our most vulnerable moment that they caused. We were living our life. We were happy. Our kids were fine. Our daughter was not transgender before art club. They attacked our family. And then they, you know, in our weakest moment, attacked us further. Yep. When you look at transgender stuff, it, it really is a reflection of so much else in the culture, and it is what is true and what is not true, and how do you define what's true? Really at the heart of the transgender movement is, is uh, what is truth? That is the question, what is truth? And so in like 2008-ish, we start seeing um, the adoption of the transgender ideology in a more widespread way. So we have whole systems in place from higher ed and how we're teaching uh, education and what we have prioritized as important. And we also have the research realm that has adopted also this kind of question of what is truth. So you see a movement away from really validating uh, scientific methods used to make inquiry to a scientific method that's more about validating a hypothesis rather than, than finding out whether or not that hypothesis is true. So you have all of this convergence of, of um, different problematic social thought that is contributing to the end result of really transing kids. And that's a very simplistic answer, but um, that it starts with what is truth and it ends with you can be your own God, you can be whatever you want it to be. Well, if you look at Erickson's th theories of childhood development, the one thing that gets the kid into a solid base is defining reality and fantasy. And if you blur that line or eliminate that line, the child gets into a severe anxiety state. I mean, it is the background from which anxiety comes. When they are not sure what's real and what's fantasy and they nightmare about it and they fear and they don't know, there's not a solid ground where they can say, on this side, I know I'm okay. On that side, I'm just pretending, okay? When you blur that line and, and do that in their environment with pronouns, you're not only hurting the child who is struggling with gender identity, you're hurting all of the peers Children are being taught today through the pseudoscience of gender ideology that doctors assign sex at birth. Even that is misleading. Sex is observed. It is not assigned arbitrarily. But that you choose your gender identity, that it's completely separate from biological sex, and that you can choose to be a boy, a girl, neither, or both. It starts in kindergarten, you know, with, with the pronoun stuff. Um, they, they've found a way to insert this into absolutely everything. The, the pronoun question is a direct attack on the nature of creation and the nature of God. And obviously, I would encourage parents to tell their kids the truth. The truth is that God created us. The truth is He made us men and women. And we should use the pronouns that reflect that. Yeah, and after the conversations with, with the principal and with the school board and sort of when we started to get our wits about what had happened, our first inclination then was to call the police. I mean, this is sexual abuse of a child. Yep. And it wasn't necessarily by the school, but it was in the school's building by a third party organization. We had a great police officer that we worked with. Um, he was definitely on our side. He, he saw our viewpoint, was overly concerned with the situation and started to do everything he could in his power to research what he could do, what was, what, was the, what was the letter of the law. He quickly found out that because there was no physical touch or exposure, or body, exposure parts. Of body parts, that there was very little that he could do. Mm -hmm. He did suggest to Aaron, and, and thank God he suggested this, was if it was me, I would get as loud as possible. Um, and thank God Erin is a great speaker and, and she did just that. She took that to heart and she got as loud as possible. The sheriff's words to me were just because I can't find a legal way to hold these people accountable doesn't mean this isn't wrong. 
it doesn't mean other parents don't deserve to be aware of what's happening. And so he did. He encouraged me to inform other parents any way I could to protect other kids and families from going through this. And so I contacted a lawyer. I contacted over 40 lawyers trying to find anyone that would help us hold the school district accountable and stop them. I mean, really, our, our goal was to stop it. We, we were suffering. We were in the trenches going through it suffering with our child and just thinking, I can't imagine other families having to go through this and I was willing to do anything to stop it. So I stood before the school board. I, I cried. You know, I, I had, didn't even know what a school board did at that point. I, I had never paid attention before. And here I was standing before them, begging them to listen to me and to change what they were doing. And it took months to get anyone to respond to me and repeated follow up. So I finally got a, a sit down with one of our school board members and it turns out she's good friends with that woman who was in the classroom that day. She condoned everything that happened. She agreed that gender and sexuality are never binary, that they're on a spectrum, that we should be teaching our kids at a young age, that they can be any gender they want. And so it became clear to me in that moment when she wasn't backing down from anything that happened, she was condoning it. She felt no remorse. This was all part of an agenda she had been working on for who knows how long and we just happened to find out about it and we happened to not be quiet about it. And I don't think they were ready for parents like us who were going to speak up and say something about it because in those public record emails we found, they, they talk about, you know, their collusion. They talk about anything we say is evidence. And they even said that the school board has worked to remove these barriers referring to parents who find out as barriers from other middle schools. They talked about moving this agenda forward and, and you know, thwarting parents like us who objected to it. So we just, you know, unfortunately for them, found out what they were doing and spoke up and objected to it. And that caused them to take a lot of steps that I now think made things worse. Honestly, I think us speaking up emboldened them to be more brazen with their agenda and, and enact more diversity, equity, inclusion staff. They hired a, an internal LGBTQ coordinator. They have a 15-page transgender toolkit that they use that is not available to the public. I found it buried deep within a public record request. They do gender support plans, which are secret transition plans of children as young as elementary. I even found emails from an elementary school where they had transitioned a child's gender. The parents found out and objected. They took it to administration. They took it to legal. And the direction from the administration was ignore what the parents' wishes are, transition the child, and call them something else when you call home. So their direction across the board is to transition kids and lie to parents about it. And we're lucky it didn't get that far with us. We didn't get to a formal plan that I know of, but I know there's a lot of kids in, in just in our district who have been transitioned and they're called a different name and pronoun at school and their parents don't know. It is your God-given, inalienable right to love and care for your own children the way only a parent can. It is not hateful nor political to ask for full involvement in your child's education and healthcare decisions. As I've learned the hard way, when my public school district intentionally conducted secret gender and sexuality programming with my little girl, our parental rights are under attack in this state. Our government is attempting to assume the role of parents through legislation like House Bill 1003. When my daughter was experiencing gender confusion at just 12 years old, she met with multiple therapists. Thanks to existing laws like 1120 and 1129, those therapy visits only made her worse. They could only affirm her gender confusion. She became confused, depressed, even suicidal. Thank God we were involved and we had the ability to choose alternative mental health care options that suited our child's needs. There is overwhelming research and evidence that family and parental support are absolutely pivotal to a child's development and mental health state. Our government is removing families from the equation. They're robbing us of the right to care for our own children while they're at their most vulnerable and they're encouraging secrecy from parents. But we are still here making our voices heard because our voices matter. And there is strength in numbers. Our strength in numbers is powerful. Parents, enough is enough. 
This attack on parental rights stops right here, right now. We say no to secrecy. We say no to excluding parents. And we say no to House Bill 1003. Erin has gotten loud. She has shared their story with news networks from across the country, and it has been reported internationally. Erin has also spoken to numerous groups here in Colorado, and other parents and grandparents are beginning to stand with her. Over the past several years, I have watched as radical elements within the legislature and the governor's office have pushed these dangerous policies. They are stripping away from parents their ability to protect their children from this indoctrination that has become so pervasive in our public schools. When I first heard Aaron's story, I knew that this should be shared with the nation. And that is why we have created this documentary. We don't want to exaggerate or minimize their story. To give context, we have included expert testimony to help explain the history and the trajectory of this extreme ideology. This is simply their authentic first-hand experience. We've learned the hard way that in Colorado where we are, there's a lot of laws that back this up. This, this has been something that's clearly been in the works for a long time. I mean, in 2019, they passed multiple bills that enabled our child to pursue mental health counseling at 12 and not tell us, to be prescribed at 12 and not tell us. Um, and, and unfortunately, when you go to a therapist in this state, it's illegal to do anything other than affirm gender confusion. So when a child 12 years old like ours goes to a therapist, which of course is the logical thing that any parent would do is find their child mental health counseling in this situation, they're legally obligated to affirm the confusion. They can't question it. They can't ask probing questions to try to get to the root cause of the kid's feelings. They just have to say, you're transgender, you're right. You're transgender, let's go with that. And they push our children down this path. It, it feels to me like all part of a, a system and there's different working parts to it. There's the school system, the mental health, health system, the legislature, and they're all working in conjunction, the foster care system. I actually found out that the woman who assaulted our child that day is a foster parent and has proudly called CPS on dozens of families. And she's there to receive those kids who are not being supported at home for their gender identity. So there's so many different components of this machine that's yeah. capturing our kids. Yeah, it's amazing to me how the gender ideology that's being pushed in our schools is so closely tied to sexual preference yet it doesn't fall under the same guidelines of you know, sexual education and, and, the, and the laws that govern how they can present that to our children, right? And, and they, they, they definitely continue to say, this isn't about sex, this isn't about sex. And I even got that from the superintendent. Mm -hmm. This is about gender, this isn't about sex. Before I turned around the pamphlet that was handed to my daughter where it clearly said, who are you sexually attracted to? Which basically is asking an 11 year old, who do you want to have sex with? Which yep. was unbelievable to me. It was actually unbelievable to the superintendent as well. He put on a good fake. He as circled it, it in was... front of me. This is disturbing. Passed it off to his assistant. Let's research this. It's still out there. It's still there. He didn't do anything about it. It's in the curriculum. But how can how can this gender movement be so closely tied to sexual preference and not be held to the same standards of sexual, you know, sexual training in schools? I I just don't understand that at all. Yeah, you're right. We, we sat down with the superintendent who acted shocked and he acted, you know, disappointed and he acted like he cared. And we believed him. He was really good at making us believe that he cared. And then his actions that were the complete opposite of what he told us he was going to do showed us that he was part of this agenda. He's a major player in it. He's one that's advocated for more gender and sexuality programming. He even hired an LGBTQ coordinator to handle all of the programming and these gender support plans in the district. In fact, in her job description, it says coaching students. It is part of her job to coach students on LGBTQ issues. So this man really led us to believe that he cared, that he was going to do something about it. And it was just gaslighting. It was to keep us quiet. He had colluded with the school board and with the other players in this agenda to keep us quiet. And it worked for a while. We really believed him. 
And then when we saw how his actions were hurting other kids, we realized we can't be quiet. Mm -hmm. I think the only way to fight this is, is, like the police officer told us, get as loud as possible. And pull your kids out of the school. I kick myself all the time. You know, I was a product of a public school. He was a product of public school. It's convenient. And I fault myself now for not realizing that this kind of thing could happen. Times are different. So we, again, never let her go back to school the next day. And the principal let her pass. There was a, another four weeks of school, and he let her continue without completing any work or stepping foot in the school again. I think it was a struggle for us originally, too. We didn't know what to do. <laughs> and I think we went back and forth on whether we send her or not. We didn't know. We didn't know what to do. We weren't prepared for this situation mm. on purpose. Now we find out. And we, we really struggled with that. And I think ultimately... I said, she's not going back. I think that was your call. And I just said, no. I put my foot down. I said, she's never going to step foot in that building again. Yeah. And that was it. And she never did. And, and thank God never will. And we looked at all of our options, you know, outside of public school. We were both working parents. And so we looked into charter school and private school. And, and we were desperate. We put our name in every hat that wasn't the public school just to get her somewhere that we felt was more safe. Um, ultimately decided on a, a small private Christian school, and, and that's still where she is and is doing well there. <laughs> Night and day difference after pulling her out of the public school, socially, academically, all of it. She, she has support there that she didn't have in the public school. So that's been a big one for us with her is, is removing her from that toxic environment of the public school and eliminating the possibility of those same players getting to her and, and making it worse. I think it's important to note, too, that this is everywhere. This isn't just in public schools. It's a social contagion amongst adolescent kids that, you know, they're, it's coming at them from every angle. It's, it's, you know, on cartoons now. It's when you watch commercials, there's talk about, you know, non-binary. And I think it's what's cool nowadays. It, right? it is, it's, it's what's cool. It's permeated our culture yep. and it's definitely caused a social contagion. But the issue with public school is that the, facil the, the faculty are, are perpetuating the social contagion. And in our case, they're the ones that planted the seed in our daughter's head. So I, I wasn't all the external forces because we were pretty good at protecting her from those. But the, the difference there is, yes, there's a social contagion amongst kids. And even in private Christian schools, you know, we know of there being some kids who identify as transgender in her little private school. But the difference is that the faculty is not there perpetuating it. They're not making it worse. They're not teaching kids to lie to their parents about it. In fact, in a private Christian school, they're teaching kids that parent involvement is really important and that familial relationships are really important. And so it's, you know, they're not pushing these kids down the path. It still exists. The ideas exist everywhere. But in public school, it's like a fast-tracked medicalization. It's like they, it, to me, it's almost like they want bad mental health numbers so that they can get more funding to push more pro programming. And it's a continual catch 22 and our kids are caught in the middle of it. When a child socially transitions, they're almost like, almost always likely to go down the path of, of a physiological transition. So once you get a child on that, on that road, there's usually no turning back. And to do that behind a parent's back is very dangerous. And it goes against what we know of, of clinical practice because um, when we do clinical work with a child, we bring in the family because we know we can't really treat the child in isolation. So what has flipped in the mind of um, clinicians, practitioners, and the state. Who are they thinking is the parent? Because you cannot treat a child without the context of, of a family. So we're, that's a very dangerous place to be in, to, to think that the school is now in charge of the, the upbringing of, of a child. The parents are kept in the dark. Everybody else knows that the child is struggling over confusion of their sex, which can be very serious. They even cite suicidal ideation. Yet you're gonna keep parents out of this who are charged with the mental health and medical care of that child? So many times these co-occurring issues, including 
potential suicidal ideation are being swept under the rug in the name of gender ideology. And this is not in the best interest of not only these children, but it is not in the best interest of the parent-child relationship. She has always been a very girly girl. You know, when she was three, we painted her room bubblegum pink. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, always had maternal instincts too, I think. Always had the maternal instinct with her younger brothers, for sure. Um, loved pigtails, loved Barbies and ponies and all the things little girl loved. Um, Hello Kitty. And, you know, as she started to go through puberty, we could see, and, and through the COVID lockdown, we could see kind of a regression socially. She became more isolated. She, um, you know, had less friends. She became more dependent on video games as social interaction. Um, and then this incident happened and it, it was like a downward spiral. It, we just watched her decline into depression. And I think there might have been some indicators there. Again, the COVID isolation and moving and having a new sibling. And there's a lot that contributed to her mental health um, and her vulnerability at that point. But from the day of art club for the next year, it was just this scary, dark, downward spiral. And, and we were put in a position where we didn't know how to communicate with her about what she was going through. We didn't understand the issue. We were caught off guard by it. We didn't know what to make of it. And so we, we really stu struggled with communication with her. Mm -hmm. um, if I had it to do differently, I would have faced it head on right from the get-go. And then we took her to therapy. And that was mostly because I wanted you to have the tools to know how to talk to her. And she's a daddy's girl. Yeah. Yeah. We, we my daughter and I always had a very close relationship. Um, sorry. <clears throat> Yeah, definitely strained, definitely a different person. I think she was always very happy-go-lucky. Um, until she wasn't. Until she wasn't. I think, I think there was a lot of factors that sort of played into her susceptibility um, leading up to the event, which is un unfortunate for everyone. We all had to go through COVID together. Um, but I think my daughter, as a, as a whole, was a very happy person. We'd always do projects together. She'd always be in the garage with me. Um, you know, we'd program apps together. Um, Engineer brain. Very smart, very outgoing, a very personable person. Mm -hmm. I think sort of the perfect storm happened with her. It being puberty, COVID, isolation and us moving that sort of created the perfect vulnerable candidate for them to inject these ideas into her head and that probably played into why it happened so quickly why just a three-hour meeting could change yeah. her so wholeheartedly i do recall initially when we found out about the organization that was in the schools locally the very first thing we did was research what this organization was. And the very first thing on their page was their enrollment was up 500%. Since COVID. And that was such an alarming number to me. Whose enrollment goes up 500%? Well, we know whose enrollment goes up 500%. Someone who's preying on these vulnerable kids. They know they're vulnerable. They see that they're hurting. And what's the solution? Well, obviously they must need to be more queer. And that was her agenda. Let's queer up the schools. Let's prey on these vulnerable children. We decided to take our daughter to therapy. We started with a therapist who, um, it was very hard to find one because it was COVID and there were not a lot of people that would do pediatric counseling. So we found a therapist. We sat down with her. She was very upfront about the fact that she was queer and trans affirming and clearly did not align with our family values and aimed to affirm our daughter's confusion so we didn't use her so we found a new therapist um, we allowed her to do some sessions but we realized that the therapy made it worse that we live in a state where again licensed counselors are required to affirm it and it, it definitely we saw a mental health decline instead of her getting better um, so about six months after the incident December of 2021 we received a suicide note from our little girl 
and it it was clear that she understood she was confused and she said since it happened since art club happened i don't know how to make sense of my thoughts i don't feel comfortable in my body and and it was a it was a dark note mm-hmm. and it was scary and we knew we couldn't take her to a therapist because that had exacerbated the whole issue so we get the suicide note we're terrified I you know, worry about her every moment of every day. I wonder if when I wake up in the morning, she's gonna be there. And so we, knowing we can't go back to therapy because it made it worse, we take her to her pediatrician. And the pediatrician gives her a mental health survey and has me leave the room and talks alone with her. And I still don't know what conversation was had. Really, we were just reaching at straws at this point. Desperate. Anything that could help. We. We finally sort of broke and said, yeah, if if there are antidepressants that could help her come out of this, maybe the pediatrician could help. I was just scared and I was desperate and I was willing to do anything to keep her alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she told us, we're. she looked at me and said, Dad, I'm still having dark thoughts. And and I've never been a proponent of of using any sort of drugs on kids. our, 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 Our son is sort of... ADD. ADD, but you know... The, the pediatricians, you know, should we put them on something? You know, just let them be a boy. Boys will be boys. Let them, let them be rambunctious. It's what they need. So we've always been hesitant to, to turn to sort of any sort of medical drugs for this kind of stuff. Um, but she was hurting. She was hurting. We couldn't go to therapy. We didn't necessarily know what to do. But here again, we weren't addressing the transgender issue. We no. were addressing the, the depression and the suicidality. And I, again, just wanted to keep her alive. I was desperate just to keep her alive. But because we weren't handling the transgender issue, she wasn't getting better. I, I don't know that the mm-hmm. antidepressants did anything they for didn't. her. We ultimately weaned her off without her even realizing she'd been weaned off and nothing changed. It wasn't until we realized we have to take a head-on approach with this situation. We had gone months ignoring it and hoping it would go away and hoping she would outgrow it and realize that didn't fit her. And it wasn't until John dug into some communication she had online with friends that he called her out on it. Right here at our dining room table, he slammed the phone down and said, read these messages to me. Is this really how you feel? And some of them said, you know, my parents don't understand. Um, I'm, I'm a boy. I want to be called Toby. And he had her read those out loud and she was mortified. And we said, is that really how you feel? And she thought about it and she said, it's not. It's not how I feel. And it, it was the changing point for us. It was definitely the, the turning point that got her out of the dark cloud mm-hmm. was us just finally addressing it head on and asking her, is this really how you feel? Is this really how you want to live your life? Do you really think we're not supportive? And she admitted, no, I, you are supportive. <laughs> this, this doesn't feel right. And so we were finally able to help talk her through it and help her understand the forces that were at play that that confused her and the influences that we had removed that she realized were bad influences. And that truly was the moment where it started to turn around as far as her mental health and her um, desisting this transgender identity. We're in a place now where she fully understands what happened to her. We let her watch that Matt Walsh, What is a Woman documentary. And she looked at us and she said, why didn't I understand this was happening to me when it was happening? I said, well, that's by design. You were, you were in this system and you were vulnerable and they took advantage of you. And she said, I don't want this to ever happen to someone else. What can I do to protect other little girls from going through that? And that's part of the reason that we speak up too, because we have an obligation to protect other little girls because she asked us to. So she, she's fully aware of what happened to her and she's angry about it and she doesn't want other little girls to go through it. And she's now very grateful that we took the approach of not affirming her and pushing her into this identity that just didn't fit. So I, you know, in hindsight, I'm so glad that you reacted the way you did in anger and disbelief and not going along with it because I maybe would have. It was dad who said, nope, that's not our girl. Something happened here. Something's not right. And thank God you did, because I think this could have gone very differently if we had been affirming Mm -hmm. of her transgender identity in that moment. And she's in a good place now. She's 
mostly back to her old self, being happy and outgoing and, um, you know, wants to make friends and wants to do extracurricular activities and be involved in youth group at church. And she's just becoming more social and, and more like her old self. Sure. Quintessential 13-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> we, <laughs> we went through a moment there where we didn't recognize her, and I recognize her again now. So. Yeah. And it's amazing that she's able to see and recognize now this contagion and what's happening. And she sees it everywhere. And she's sort of in disbelief that it not only that it happened to her, but it's happening to everyone. And, it, and she points it out, which is mm -hmm. really admirable for her to have come this far to be able to not only recognize it in herself, but recognize it as a whole out in the community. So, and she worries about her little brothers too. She's she's got an eight year old and a two year old little brother, and she worries about them being bombarded with this ideology. And she asks us how we're going to approach it. With well, she'll them. and she'll she'll turn shows off. Yeah. She'll say, you know, you can't watch this show. Yeah. And she'll come get us and say, mm -hmm. mom and dad, this is why he can't watch this show. And mm -hmm. sometimes we agree. There is uh, an even more nefarious agenda behind all this. I, I see the transgender ideology as kind of a stepping stone to even broader things. And then you bring in the, the transhumanism, the, the total breakdown of an individual identity. They've already erased you know, patriotism, right? You're not allowed to identify with your own nation. Uh, you're not allowed to identify with your own family. Their the kids are being taught that their parents are fools. Uh, so every element of an individual's identity is being strategically broken down. Uh, and now they're getting even to the basic biological facts. Like, well, you know, who says you're actually a boy? Who says you're actually a girl? That in and of itself is oppressive. So this is part of a longer train with a very specific end in mind, uh, and that is the breakdown of all resistance to tyranny, the breakdown of all resistance to the collapse of the old Christian moral order. It's, it's been you know at least a century in the making, and, and we are not done yet, that's for sure. We've changed a lot from this experience. It's, there's a lot of bad that we went through and there was a really dark year and I did think we were gonna lose our daughter, I really, and that fear doesn't go away. I can't emphasize that enough, even though I know she's in a good place now, mentally. And I know she understands what happened to her. You don't go to sleep at night without worry once your child has told you they've been suicidal and, and that confused. So that, that doesn't go away, but I would say, you know, as a family, we've woken up a lot. We've become more involved um, in our schools, in church, in, you know, asking the right questions of our kids to make sure that, you know, what happened at school today was normal and okay. And yeah. so we've definitely improved as parents. Not that we were bad parents at all. We just weren't as aware of, you know, the the harms of the world that are coming at our kids as we are now. Today, it's inserted in virtually everything. Uh, and, and, you know, people struggle to understand that. How, how are you going to insert transgenderism in math? <laughs> how, how are you going to insert that in, in science um, or, or in history? But they've found a way to make this just completely ubiquitous. So when they're studying history, well, let's look at the historical contributions of transgenders. And of course, there weren't really transgenders 100 years ago, so they make them up. Right? They say, well, this person we have uh, on some secret knowledge that they might have been cross-dressers and, you know, transgenderism wasn't accepted back then. So this was an early transgender pioneer. Uh, they put it in science, right? They, they're teaching these kids that modern science has now shown that gender is actually um, something different than we understood it to be for thousands of years in virtually every human culture um, in history. So this has now become completely ubiquitous, not just across the nation, but across the entire spectrum of what passes for education today. So in, in English, they're, they're reading transgender literature. They're reading books that promote transgenderism. Um, in science, they're being taught the alleged science of transgenderism. They're being shown these completely junk studies uh, claiming that um, you know transgenderism is scientific and that uh, if you don't uh, affirm somebody's imagined or invented gender, that they're going to be at more risk of suicide or depression. I mean, it's just all the pseudoscience. And of course, they don't teach the scientific method anymore. Um, you know, if, if you look at the next generation pseudoscience standards brought up by the very same people who brought you Common Core, you get 12 years of so-called education. They'll never once hear the term scientific method. 
Uh, and I think part of the reason for that is if they understood the scientific method, they'd know that this concept of infinite genders is not scientific. In fact, it's total quackery. My daughter and I had a really good way of communicating prior to this. I think that maybe there were certain subjects we didn't address or communicate with well on now that I see, but we do now. You know, I grew up in a family where I, I, I didn't have religion. I, I didn't have, you know, faith in, in my life, and I didn't necessarily have that for, for our kids. We, <laughs> we fell short, for sure, prior to this, yeah. in giving them a, a, a Christian foundation. Yeah, which I think is really important. We weren't giving her the understanding that she's perfectly and, and wonderfully made by God and that there could be nothing wrong with the way she was made. Yeah. And so we allowed her mind to be infiltrated with these thoughts of there's something wrong with me and I hate my body and I was made wrong and I need to change myself. And I, and I think if we had had that foundation prior to this incident happening, we maybe could have avoided it. She could have been self-secure enough to know that she's perfect the way she is. So in hindsight, you know, we've improved as a family now with our younger kids, giving them that foundation in church, giving them that relationship with God and that understanding that there's nothing wrong with them, no matter what anyone tells them. There's nothing wrong with who they are and how they were made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think as a father, I, I knew the lessons to sort of teach her that concept so yeah but we've we've changed <laughs> this and then usually that's the way right there's some cataclysmic event that leads you to God or back to God and it took a really scary horrible awful experience for our entire family to bring us back there and and all of our kids are better for it now mm -hmm. definitely Well, I, I think there are multiple interest groups that have various agendas, and, and I don't know that all of them necessarily even understand the interests of others. I mean, obviously, there's the profit motive here. There is so much money being made. They're turning these poor kids into lifelong customers of this monstrous and very sick industry that profits from the mutilation and, and the, the harming of children's bodies. Beyond just the, the quacks trying to make a lot of money and the pharmaceutical interests, of course, Big Pharma has a, a major interest, there's an even more diabolical agenda in mind. Uh, the, the subject of transhumanism is only just now starting to rear its ugly head, but it's not new. Uh, there are people who believe that they're going to transcend humanity. Um, and, and they say so openly, right? You don't, you don't have to go into the smoky rooms to see this. They, they speak about this in their own conferences. They write papers about it. Um, and at the most uh, elite levels of our society, if you will, uh, this is something of an open secret. Uh, there are a lot of these people. They've rejected God. They've rejected uh, the Bible. And so they're concerned about, well, what happens when I die? They're absolutely terrified of death. And so they believe that they are going to transcend not just gender, not just their biological sex. Uh, they believe in transcending their humanity. Um, they, they believe, many of them, that they're going to achieve eternal life by uploading their minds into a computer system. And I, I realize this sounds totally crazy to a normal person, and it is totally crazy, but this is what they believe. Um, and you, you have people like you all know Harari. He thinks he's going to evolve into a god. He wrote a whole book about it. Uh, and this is not just some you know fruitcake at some obscure university. This is a guy who gives keynote speeches at the World Economic Forum. This is a guy whose work has been endorsed by uh, the fascist who runs Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, by Barack Obama, by Angela Merkel, the former chancellor of Germany. Um, so he's a kook, but he's not just you know some raving tinfoil hat guy. Uh, and this is a guy who speaks publicly about how he thinks he's going to be evolving into a god by merging with technology. Um, and, and so I think as you dig into this insane ideology that animates the transgender movement, there really is a much more diabolical agenda just beneath the surface, and that is transhumanism. Um, I think from the totalitarian perspective, the totalitarians have a big interest in this. They need to atomize the individual. They need to detach the individual from every element of their identity that would anchor them into reality, that would allow them to put up opposition 
to the plans of these totalitarians. And so that includes very much uh, their identity as Americans, say, if we're dealing with the United States. And the same thing is true, for example, in Europe. Uh, you know, the kids are being brainwashed against patriotism, against their own country. They're being told that uh, the nation state is what causes war. Uh, they're being brainwashed against the faith of their parents and the faith of their forefathers. They're being told that Christianity is oppressive, that it's a white supremacist religion, that they have Christian privilege that they need to repent for. And of course, all of this is ludicrous. If these kids got any legitimate education, they'd know it was absurd. Christianity is a, a religion that came out of the Middle East. Right? And, and when the gospel came to Scandinavia, for example, these people were barbarous, savage pagans who were murdering each other and sacrificing their daughters to demon gods. I mean, there's, there's nothing white supremacist about that. Uh, and yet this is what these kids are being taught. So they're being separated from their identity um, of their country. They're being separated from their identity as a member of their family. So the kids are being taught that their parents are responsible for global warming, that their parents are responsible for environmental devastation, that their parents are responsible for war and the oppression of, you know, pick your victim class. Um, so their identity is being completely shattered. Um, Donald Trump actually uh, hit the nail on the head in his speech at the Mount Rushmore, his uh, Independence Day speech. He said, that, you know, the reason our cities are burning down is because our children are being radicalized in the public schools. And transgenderism is a big part of that. Um, if you can get them to reject the identity that God gave them, right? And, and to be clear, male or female, God created people, male or female. So if you can get them to reject something as fundamental as the very essence of who God created them to be, you can get them to believe anything. You can get them to do anything. Definitely, as a whole, we are stronger as a family. You know, coming out the other side of it. Oh yeah. In more ways than one. We really focused on family time, and I think that's indicative of any modern family. Now we're all moving a mile a minute. We have smartphones for everything. We, you know, there's so many calls for our attention that we we tend to neglect the most important thing in our life, and that's our family. And through this, especially through removing our daughter's negative influences, like the video games and the friends, we tried to replace those things with positive influence, with more family time, with more dad and daughter time, with exemplifying you know, a healthy male-female relationship for her to know that this there's nothing wrong with it. Because mm -hmm. in art club, she was told that heterosexuality and monogamy are not normal, they're just common. I, I don't even know what to make of that, no. but we try very hard to make sure she understands it is normal and it's okay. And it's, it's okay to be in a, a monogamous heterosexual relationship. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't make you a bad person. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make you an oppressor. It, it is normal. So th this is an absolutely monstrous agenda. There are, I think, multiple interest groups, the, the big pharma interest, the, the quack medical professionals, uh, the transhumanist weirdos the totalitarians who want to break down the old order. I think a fundamental guy to understand what's happening here is Antonio Gramsci. Um, he recognized that Marx was wrong on some really critical things. You know, Marx had posited that eventually the working class was going to rise up and overthrow the system and overthrow the bourgeoisie. And of course, that never happened. <laughs> right? uh, so Marx was clearly wrong. And uh, Marxists will never admit that. But they all know that what Marx prophesied was going to happen didn't happen. Antonio Gramsci actually realized, hey, what's happening here is this Christian culture is, is holding back these people who should be rebelling, who should be having a revolution. And so we've got to break down the Christian culture. We've got to march through the institutions, through education, through academia, through uh, the judicial branch, through the entertainment, uh, you know, the, the, all of these different elements of culture. And that's how we're eventually going to capture power. Um, and I think transgenderism is a critical part of that. Um, if you look, for example, at queer theory, which is a, a huge right under the surface element of this transgender movement. Um, queer theory is actually just a subset of critical theory. And critical theory is essentially putting into practice the ideas of Antonio Gramsci. And transgenderism is a major, it's kind of like the next phase in queer theory. Now there will be more, right? If you read the early queer theorists, they were talking about normalizing and legalizing pedophilia, right? So, so we're not at the end destination yet, but transgenderism is a major component of this queer theory. And queer theory is really just a subset of critical theory, which is really just the reframed, redeveloped version of Marxist theory. I've spoken to a lot of parents of kids who've been through this and they had no idea. And so I think it's important to know what questions to ask your kids too. We're really big on with our younger kids because it's we don't want to talk about gender and sexuality. They're eight and two. 
but we've been really big on making sure all our kids know it's never okay for an adult to tell you to keep a secret. It doesn't matter what the secret is. They're not a safe adult if they ask you to lie to your parents. Um, and no one should ask you what your identity is or, or encourage you to label yourself or define yourself as anything. Our kids know they just are who they are. They're each unique and there's nothing wrong with them, no matter what someone tells them. So, so for me, you know, it's really important for parents to instill these things in their kids before it happens. Had we done that, maybe our daughter would have been strong enough to, to know that there was nothing wrong with her and that that label wasn't going to fit. And there's no wrong time to do that. Again, our kids are eight and two and they both know that an adult can't tell you to keep a secret and there's nothing wrong with who you are. My main goal as a father speaking up is just to educate other, other fathers and other families. Like this, this isn't okay. If it's happening to you, it's not, you're not alone. Um, it's happening to all of us. These actors are there and, and, and it's, it's scary and it's very real and, and, and there are very real consequences to all of it. Make sure you have a good open communication with your children. Um, so be, be prepared because the system is not going to prepare you and that is on purpose. My number one advice to parents is get your kids out of public schools. They're not safe. It's just not safe. It doesn't matter where you live. We're in a conservative community in what was formerly a very red state and, and it happened here. And it happened here by design. They targeted our community because we're conservative. So I know it's happening everywhere. I've connected with families all over the country who have had this happen to them in, in entirely red states like Florida. It's just happening everywhere. So to me, the only way to protect your children from this kind of indoctrination, this kind of harm, is to pull them out of government schools. Don't put them in an environment where this can happen because it's intentionally happening in secret. It's been two and a half years since I went to that art club meeting at my school. I'm no longer dealing with gender confusion, despite how difficult it was for me and my family. It's still hard to believe my school did this to me, but I'm lucky and I'm grateful for my parents who helped me through it. My only hope with our story is that it can save other girls from going through what I did.